yeah, be kind. The question about schizophrenia, like, I agree with you that uh, a big part of it is just that our culture should, should be more tolerant of people that are crazy. If there was a place for them, then maybe less of them would, have to, would be warehoused off like uh, people in un- less developed countries. They tend to do, schizophrenics tend to do much better in those cultures. But my question is the fact that a lot of them really are suffering, and they really are suffering with the voices in their heads, and many of them do commit suicide because they're suffering so much with those voices, and some of them do see the hospital as a place, a safe place for them. And what, you know, how, do you, how do you balance those? those yeah, two? well, I think the paranoid kind of schizophrenia is different from this process schizophrenia. And, and, from having seen people in that state, it's clearly a very uncomfortable state. Uh, these people are not happy. They don't like being where they are. It doesn't seem like a very functional state. I think what we're dealing with is probably a, a, a group of pathologies that may or may not have common origins. These may be completely different screw-ups, chemical or genetic screw-ups of one sort or another. Uh, certainly the catatonic schizophrenic and the process schizophrenic present completely differently. The catatonic doesn't move, has nothing to say, can't care for their own body functions. The process schizophrenic wants to reorganize the company and call the president and to talk, uh, you know, invest and invent and travel and speak and heal, heal and cure and uh, they're just all over the map. It's a it's a whole different style. So, you know, in the in the classification of fungi, they have this classification called uh, uh, fungi obscuranta, and it just means everything we haven't classified. And I think probably schizophrenia will be seen to be a, a group of unrelated phenomena requiring different kinds of inter- intervention and different kinds of. Uh, Therapy. You know, when the psychedelics were first coming on, everybody had the idea, aha, these things are what was called psychotomimetics. In other words, they imitate psychosis. And so then people said, well, it must be that people produce DM, that schizophrenics are overproducing DMT or they're producing LSD like compounds in their blood. And people went tearing off in search of, of the schizogen it was called in the literature. Well, the schizogen was never found. Uh, schizophrenics have slightly depleted levels of DMT than the ordinary population, not dramatically depleted. Uh, no other chemical analog as a real marker for schizophrenia has, uh, has been found. So it's, it's more complicated than that. And once you go back through the literature and compare with more attention to detail, the differences are clear. The paranoid schizophrenic hears voices. Visual hallucinations are actually pretty rare. Uh, Hallucinogenic trips inevitably tend to be more positive than what schizophrenics are reporting. Uh, You know, you have only to contrast my encounters with zany, punning, self-transforming elf machines, compare that to these gray-faced proctologists who come in the middle of the night and look up your ass and take you off and, you know, abuse you and surgically snip and tuck. And I mean, this is appalling stuff, the stuff of nightmare. If there was a drug that did that, none of us would get near it, I dare say, after one exposure. Yeah. Eight circuit model of evolution. Um, Because I was thinking that, or it just sounds really close to what you were talking about, especially the neurogenetic level, where you can tune into the actual DNA and get a sort of a readout of the evolutionary process and pattern. So, um, yeah, I like the model. I'm not sure of the mechanism. Uh, on the other hand, one of the most mysterious issues in neurophysiology is the issue of memory. In other words, where is it? Uh, we know that in the course of your lifetime, every molecule in your body will be swapped out five
five times. Well, then how can a 70-year-old woman remember the smell of her grandmother's dress when she used to climb up into her lap? Uh, you know, we know that people can undergo horrific accidents, brain damage and <laughs> cancer of the brain and this sort of thing, and that their memory is, in some cases, virtually unscathed. Uh, this has been, in fact, the greatest embarrassment of materialist science in the past 50 years, or one of them, is they have made zilch progress on understanding memory. And, you know, it's right smack in the center of everything we want to do. It's a communication technology. It's a nanotechnology. It's a molecular genetic technology for information and storage retrieval that works with images, music, sound. And we don't have a clue as to how it works. I, I, I tend to believe that nature is fairly conservative and that once you develop a mechanism that's good for a certain function, you will find it iterated in other areas where that function is called upon. So notice that the DNA, in a way, if you understand how it works, it's like a chemical learning system. It, it templates the environment and it responds to environmental selection by building proteins of a certain type. In a way, it, it, it's a chemical engine for responding uh, to the environment. Well, then if you look at the nervous system, it's an electrochemical system. It's a combinatory system where uh, information moves in the body down the nerve fibers at, at a pretty good clip. But why then are we such slow-moving creatures? Well, because every time it gets to a synaptic cleft, it stops being electricity and it turns into a complex chemical reaction to bridge the gap to go down the next wire to the next gap. And so in this, in the course of this electro to chemical to electro to chemical transmission of the signal, it slows down to a few hundred miles an hour. And that's, that determines our speed as organisms. Uh, downstream, th this may all uh, be sped up. Memory seems to work almost instantaneously. But no mechanism is visible. I mean, if you really want to look at a human function that's present in all of us and easily studied and may hint at undiscovered principles in physics or miraculous new orders of nature, human memory would be a, a real place to begin, I think. And I wondered what your involvement is today, what you hope to get at, have hoped to get out of your involvement with the rave scene, and um, just what role do you think youth culture will have in the next 12, 13 years as we approach a possible singularity? Well, I didn't intend to get involved in rave really I mean I was interested in it I, when I went to England in 1990 uh, I had a pretty academic schedule of lecturing but a lot of ravers came and the zippies were just getting organized around the club called Megatripolis in Charing Cross and I met Colin Shaman of the Shaman and then we talked about me doing something with them and uh, and he taped our conversation and then I thought it was like a job interview but then when it was all over he said that would do fine that that was what they would use on the record and that became and then so that CD was called Boss Drum and just by chance it went double platinum in England which means, hard to believe, but every 15th person in the British Isles bought this album. And so it was a mega hit. And suddenly I, I was an icon to a whole bunch of people who had never heard of me before. And then I worked with Zivuya, which was another English band, Tribal, a Spiral Tribe, which was an English band, 
I met a Austrian couple in Frankfurt who are Station Rose, which was a German doof band. And last year I went to South Africa and uh, and Australia and ended up doing raves there. It's a kind of a weird thing for a person my age uh, to you know be the world's oldest raver or something. <laughs> uh, but the rave scene needs to be more psychedelic. You know, it 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 get breaks down. It breaks toward amphetamine. It breaks toward heroin. It breaks toward alcohol. You have to keep constantly reminding it. Plus, the the youth culture is incredibly powerful and creative. You know, people talk about the 1960s and what a great thing it was. Well, I was there. I was at ground zero. And it lasted from about 1966 until 19, early 1968. And 1968 was called the the year of rage or the days of rage. That was all street fighting and rocking out bank windows and burning police cars. The summer of love, which was 1967, it was like a two-year thing, 66, 67. The current youth culture has been going in the same direction strong since 1986. There are people who will tell you if you were not in London in the summer of 88, you missed it. And, you know, and yet there are kids who obviously don't feel they missed it because they were children in 1988. Uh, So it's an incredibly vital culture. It's worldwide. It's high, it was born in the bowels of Thatcherite Britain. And it's very cynical about bourgeois social values and getting a job and fitting in and all that. And uh, it speaks German, Afrikaner, you know, Japanese, French, English with equal fluency. And uh, it's not rock and roll. You know, the ultimate heresy against the 60s musical fascisti uh, it's it's not rock and roll. It's doof. If it's anything, it comes out of hip hop. It's syncopated, and and ambient and experimental. And I, you know, I I really don't understand the youth bashing tendency of this culture. It seems to me one of the most chuckle headed things that we're involved in is youth bashing because it all rides on the back of youth. They're the ones who are going to uh, be asked to live in and perfect the future that all this technology and integration and bioengineering and so forth and so on is going to bring to fruition. And the great thing about the youth culture, and there are many great things about it, but one is that it's so suspicious of bourgeois values and that it's so friendly to the Internet. You know, the Internet is owned and managed by the Fortune 500 corporations, but they own and manage it somewhat like a little old lady who owns a gorilla. They really fear it, and they don't understand it, and and they have to hire guys with rings in their ears and ponytails uh, to turn on the machines in the morning and to run the payroll software and the inventory control software and everything. So it's a very uneasy uh, alliance. Um, as far as whether I'll do more with rave culture, I don't know. I keep trying to back out of it. It's It's different. It's strange to go on stage in front of a screaming crowd at 2 a.m. and try to talk philosophy. And so I've given up trying to talk philosophy, and instead I find myself behaving more incoherently and uh, crazily than I do in any other fashion. And the crowd seems to love it, but the crowd is predisposed to love it. Uh, The crowd is not terribly discriminating uh, at that (laughs) point. But I have been working with a band called Lost at Last, a Maui band transplanted to Santa Cruz. And if you're in San Francisco, New Year's Eve will be at the Veterans Administration 
doing glossolalia and handling boa constrictors with light show and the whole razzmatazz. <laughs> if only this had come when I was 20. It's, it's, I feel like Billy Pilgrim or something. <laughs> I'm living my life entirely out of sequence. I mean, what does a 51-year-old guy need with a career as a raver? <laughs> Beats the shit out of me, but there you have it. You know, and I'm poor enough. I can't just say no either. I have to negotiate this stuff. Oh, yeah, it's a shamanic role for sure. I mean, jump and jack flash, it's a gas, gas, gas. For sure it's a shamanic role. Uh, but I'm sure, I mean, it would be perfectly reasonable to stand aside and let a 22-year-old do it, to let Spooky do it, let somebody else do it. Yeah. Um, with all your talk about the, the proctologists who come in the night, what do you think about uh, the extraterrestrials? I thought you would never ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, before I wade in, visor down, razors flashing, let me say that I have at times proposed various extraterrestrial theories because it seemed to me back in the mid 70s that if you were to take seriously the idea that there was an extraterrestrial penetration of the terrestrial ecology that the mushroom would be it the mushroom is alien enough in its life cycle alien enough to survive the conditions of outer space and when complexed with a mammalian nervous system it seems to want to download these messages from far away shall we say so that's my idea of of how an alien would be that the first problem you would have with a real alien would be to recognize it because first of all it's going to be alien for crying out loud this thing evolved on some other planet under a completely different chemical and regime of pressure and chemistry and and I mean if you can't understand your next door neighbor do you th what do you think it's going to be like to stare into the face if it has a face of somebody from Zanabal Ganubi so uh, the mushroom seemed alien enough and it's also very low key it looks high technology I don't expect them to come in trillion ton ships of titanium uh, uh, roaring out of the cosmic darkness into parking orbit around our planet. I seriously doubt if it will happen that way. I if they don't want to be detected, they certainly will not be detected because you have to assume that the, uh, that the technology will be beyond your wildest imaginings. Uh, the idea that someone is going to come in ships speaking languages and with an interest in our gross industrial output or trading with us or some crap like that. This is what I call failure of scale. This is for people who don't understand how weird reality is. This is for people who've been watching too much daytime TV to think it's going to be so humdrum as that. Uh, well, so then we're left with this residuum of testimony that something weird is going on. I think this is like a built an intelligence test built into reality. Uh, life presents itself as a mystery. The people who pass the intelligence test are not worrying about gray-faced aliens checking them for hemorrhoids in the middle of the night. They have passed this intelligence test and their conclusion is, whatever this is, it is not what it claims to be. It is not what it uh, appears to be. Uh, and then people are very puzzled and they say, well, but what about all these people who have these things happen to them? Well, this now we sort of get down to the nut of the matter. And, and this is where I often feel my audience is peeling away from me in horror and disappointment. Uh, uh, 
Because I think we're very naive about what information is and how it works. And, uh, and let's see how I can give examples of this or start into it. Uh, first of all, the media that we are embedded in are designed to amplify anomalies. In other words, here's a, here's a story. Man goes to work, does moderately good job. No newspaper on earth would run this as a headline. Why? Because it's not news. It's ordinary. Uh, on the other hand, Volkswagen-sized chunk of ice falls in Massachusetts farm field. This is news. And it, it, if it passes the first gateway, which is the local news reporting apparatus, passes it on to the uh, AP and UPI and like that, then it makes its way out into the electromagnetic medium. Well, in the electromagnetic medium, the laws of perspective are weirdly distorted. The further away you are from something, the more real it looks. The closer you get to it, the less substantial it becomes in the world of media. So, for example, let's say that the New York Times on a certain day reports that in a Massachusetts field, a large chunk of ice has fallen. And so you look at that and then you think to yourself, oh, let's see what Dilbert's up to. Of course, with the New York Times, you can't feel you will not be satisfied uh, in your quest because there is no Dilbert, because uh, the great gray maiden doesn't stoop to comics. But suppose you're reading a civilized newspaper. Well, then you just go and read Dilbert. But... A newspaper like that is designed to be read by five million, six million people per day. Well, sure as hell, someone will open the paper to page 42. Chunk of ice falls in Massachusetts field. And they will notice that the county in which this field is located contains their mother's maiden name initials. (laughs) <laughs> and by that and the dream they had the night before of something wet falling in the, from the sky, they realize that God has sent them a message. Uh, and they call work and cancel and jump in the car and head for Amherst or wherever the action is. Well, meanwhile, the rest of us go on about our business with one exception. Uh, editors of newspapers where this story has been put out are now getting feedback. And people. So the editor calls up the cub reporter. He says, uh, we're really getting a lot of interest on that ice fall in Massachusetts deal. I want you to drive up there and get the story. Interview everybody. Find out what's going on. Is there a religious angle? Is there a this? Is there a that? What do people see? So this guy thinks, ay, ay, ay. You know, I have to find honest work. But until then, I have to drive up to Massachusetts and find out what's going on. The person for whom God was speaking to them and the reporter encounter each other at the edge of what is now a drying mud hole. And then he says, and who are you? He says, well, Funny you should ask. I'm Dr. Raymond Hamarubiberg, expert in telluric energies, ley lines, radiesthesic energy, genies, afrites, and ancestor spirits. And I can tell you what's going on here. This confirms a theory that I published in my book, you know, turning the world upside down in ten different ways. I self-published my book, but uh, and, and you're off at this point. And so, you know, to make a long story short, and you maybe can't always follow this advice, but it's very good advice, nevertheless, whether you can follow it or not. When confronted with the irrational or the extraordinary or the miraculous, it is legitimate to carefully examine the messenger, the key to 
to understanding what is going on is to examine the messenger. People don't do this. They examine the, the uh, testimony of the messenger. So they say, now stand exactly where you were standing when the saucer first appeared. Aha. Uh-huh. And so it was 20 degrees above the horizon and it moved so we can calculate it must have been moving at this speed. This is not the right question to be asking this person. The right question to be asking is, um, have you ever seen a ghost? What's your position on the resurrection? Uh, how do you feel about uh, homeopathy? What's your position on uh, major earth changes in the short-term uh, uh, projection of things? And if you do this, you will begin to discover an epistemological naivete, I maintain, that that the illusion that you and this person are living in the same Idaho begins to break down. They have categories and presuppositions and expectations that you can't follow along with. And so the illusion of communication is necessary for there to be the mirage of an event is essentially a way of putting it. So these things are like informational viruses. It's because of how we as organisms handle information. For example, here's a counter way to approach a problem in nature. Suppose you want to know how much electricity is running through a wire. Uh, The way to do this is to measure 100 times, add these numbers together, divide by 100, and you will have the average amount of energy flowing through the, 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 the wire. Now suppose your 100 numbers fluctuate between 3 volts and 3.5 and volts, except that measurement 72 tells you that 11,000 volts are running through this wire. Well, what do you do with that reading if you're a good scientist? Well, you throw it out. You say, well, that, that's crazy. That can't be right. There's something wrong with that one. Get that puppy out of there. In other words, you reject the anomalous. Instead of pouncing on it and triumphantly raising it on high for all to adore, you simply eliminate it. The media works exactly the opposite. It seizes on the, you know, every night a million people go out and look into the night sky. They see zilch, the stars, the moon. One person goes out, they see a triangular spaceship 800 feet across with red running lights broadcasting, you know, the second chapter of Mark. Well, what are we told the next morning that this was seen and this disrupted the night sky over Phoenix or Alamogordo or someplace like that? Always someplace you aren't, by the way. Uh, so uh, people say, well, but is it all like that? Is it all so much like that? I think it pretty much is. Uh, People don't like, I mean, I've told stories here about strange events, and I, but I've said the real weirdness does not have to be treated with respect or fr- as though it were fragile. True weirdness is true weirdness. You can kick the tires, honk the horn, drive it around the block. Phony weirdness is incredibly fragile and they don't want you to get near and you can only see it if you stand here and please don't touch and the speaker is veiled and the voice is distorted because the CIA might kill him if they knew who he was. A million reasons why it's just not totally straightforward. You know, all resting on the preposterous notion that we couldn't stand knowing the truth and therefore, these things must be shielded from us. Well, if we're so fragile, why weren't we shielded from the knowledge of the president's blowjob? I mean, that shook up more people than the knowledge that extraterrestrials are trading human fetal tissue for advanced technology. It's, it seems to me that as psychedelic people, we should be more immune to these rumors of miracles, signs, and wonders than the rest of the population because we have a benchmark to measure it against. And the cultification of discourse and the the, the t- ri- 
despising tolerance for raps, which don't make sense, is a really weird aspect of the end of the millennium discussion that we're trying to have. I mean, somebody on no evidence at all can uh, can introduce the most preposterous and outlandish hypotheses into a conversation, and it has to be treated with the same respect that the the pronouncements of quantum physics or uh, or uh, evolutionary theory are retreat are treated. Um, and then people say, well, how do you not throw out the baby with the bathwater? Well, it's tricky. I think we all need to get our razors clarified, and also a little less politesse would be all right. I don't know what it's like here. I said all these things I'm saying to you now to Rupert recently, and he said, well, you're just you know, sinking in Malibuitis. He said in an average English t- a pub, if somebody started raving about this stuff, there would be half a dozen people on their feet instantly just sneering it out of existence. Well, New- upstate New York is halfway between London and Malibu, so maybe you're leavened with uh, reason and, uh, and temperance. But there certainly is a lot of loose-headed metaphor building out there in the intellectual marketplace. We almost need a new vocabulary of fluff. You know, I mean, there are different kinds of fluff. For instance, there's what I call deep fluff, which is fluff with a history. So that would be, for example, alchemy, which is something dear to my heart. Alchemy is fluff with depth because it's 4,000 years old, and even though it's never made good on its uh, promises or agenda, it just keeps popping up in various places. It's generated a rich literature. It's deep fluff. The kind of fluff that freaks me out is where you get one person who never read uh, the Old Testament, never read Plato, uh, doesn't understand mathematics, music, history, art, literature, religion, economics, or philosophy, but they have all the answers. Because when they were in the desert, uh, you know, the archangel Malingi appeared to them and downloaded the entire shtick from A to Z in uh, 11 simple lessons which you they will share with you for a significant portion of your income. 